So good afternoon, everybody. Today, I want to share something really important, something that I think is important for our lives and the lives of the people around us. Let's have a show of hands. How many people here have some sort of chronic disease? So not a one-off disease, but something that you've had to go to the doctor and you receive continuing care for, like maybe uh, you or somebody close to you. How many people? Wow, so that's a fair number of people. Well, you may not, you may not think about this this way, but you're the lucky ones. Because not only do most people in the world not have access to high quality health care, but even when they do, a lot of people don't actually know that they need health care, right? They don't, they don't even think that they have to go to the doctor. So think about something simple like high cholesterol or high blood pressure. Both of these conditions actually consider, you know, raise considerably your risk of early death. But, but you, you don't know you have it till you go to the doctor or somebody tests for it. And you can't get better without treatment. So for that to happen, we need to have a healthcare system capable of screening people to know who has what disease and delivering care. So in most of the world, we tend to have health systems that are very hospital or clinic based, right? And this isn't bad because hospitals are critical for so many things. But hospitals aren't enough because people don't live in hospitals or clinics. Right? And thankfully, most illnesses don't require the care of a hospital. So, in fact, most conditions can be diagnosed and treated in the communities where people live and work. And so, ensuring that people who need care get care is what is meant by the last mile of care delivery. And when we're unable to deliver this last mile of care delivery, that's what's referred to as a healthcare delivery gap. Now, health delivery gaps become very apparent when we're dealing with emergencies, when we're, when we're forced to think under duress about a solution. So let's think together about a frightening health emergency. Imagine for a moment how terrible it would be if there was a bacteria or a virus that spreads in the air from person to person, you know, in homes, in airplanes, in places where people work, and you get it, you get it just by breathing. Now, if somebody can do a test that shows you you've been exposed and gives you medicine to prevent you from getting sick, then you'll be okay. But if they don't, and the bacteria or virus grows inside you, and you get full-blown disease, well, when that happens, you can spread it to your family, you can spread it to your community. And let's just say that if you get full-blown disease and, you, and you're not treated for it, you have an 80% chance of dying. So if we had something like this, we'd have to think about how to screen hundreds of thousands of people. We'd have to figure out um, how to make sure that people who were exposed get treated with preventive therapy before they get sick. We'd have to find the people who are sick and give them the treatment that they need. So we'd have to create a system to do all of this, right? I mean, if we didn't, then what we'd have is like widespread mass death, right? 80% of the people would die. So this sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like, I'm sure many of you are thinking that I've chosen this example because of what we're reading in the newspaper every day about coronavirus, which has, you know, affecting 50,000 people. It's caused, you know, about 1,400 deaths. And coronavirus is scary, to be sure, but like coronavirus, or Ebola, or even a disease like diabetes, the disease I have just described to you is frightening because it exposes the weakness of our healthcare delivery system. Weaknesses in our ability to identify people who need to receive care, whether they know it or not, and then our ability to actually deliver care. So for the last 20 odd years, I've been working on trying to figure out how to improve care delivery for the disease I just described to you. And it's a disease which, in my view, really exemplifies the healthcare delivery gaps in the world. And the solution to this disease is actually something that I think will help us think about health delivery writ large. So that disease is tuberculosis. So how many of you think that tuberculosis is a big, big disease in the world today? It's a big problem, other than the fact that I'm here talking about it. Okay, a few of you. Well, Tuberculosis, or TB as it's known in its short form, is a bacterial disease that is passed from person to person through the air. And although there's been a cure for TB since 1948, 10 million people get it every year. One million children 
get TB every year. And TB has overtaken HIV as the biggest infectious killer of adults. So why does this matter? Well, it's deadly. Almost two million people die from TB every year. That's 4,000 people a day. That's three people every minute. So it's actually happening right now. And all of this, most of this, occurs in low or middle income countries. In rich countries, the disease is, is, is rare. It's, it's, it's more or less you know, eradicated. So although there have been some successes in slowing down TB rates globally, the rates drop at around 1.5 or 1.8% per year. So that's, that's a glacial pace for a disease that kills so many people. But we know how to stop TB, right? I just told you that it's very rare. It hardly exists in rich countries. So clearly, there's a clue here about what kind of healthcare system we need to build in order to eliminate TB. And in doing so, I believe, in order to, to, to optimize the last mile of healthcare delivery. So let's look at this in depth. How was TB stopped in rich countries? What, what, what's in the secret sauce? Well, the first thing that was done is what you'd imagine for any, any disease. You have to find people who are sick or who will become sick with the disease. For TB, this actually became possible in 1895 with the creation of the x-ray. So chest x-rays are highly sensitive for TB, and they find it 90% of the time for people who have TB in their lungs. So the invention of the x-ray more than 100 years ago was a huge step forward. By the, by the early to mid 20th century, health programs in rich countries were using mobile x-ray vans to actively search for people with TB in the communities where they were living and working. And you can see that here on the graphic. And when they found sick people, they would get treated, and their close contacts would also be tested to make sure that they didn't have TB. So thousands of people sick with TB were found this way, and you can imagine that this approach became a cornerstone of the strategy to eliminate TB, looking in the community where people live. The second thing that was done was to develop a system that could treat large numbers of sick people. So the first anti-TB drug was discovered by this man, Salman Waxman, in 1943 at Rutgers University in the United States. And by 1970, there were about seven drugs to treat TB. And you know, even with all these medicines, treatment wasn't easy. Sick people had to receive multiple drugs at the same time for extended periods. In those days, in the early days, it was 18 months of therapy. Today, it's still long. It's six months of therapy. So if they didn't get the therapy, people wouldn't get cured. And, and, and sometimes, even if they took partial therapy, they would end up with worse disease than they started with. But if they did get the correct therapy, they became non-infectious within 24 hours, and they stopped spreading the disease in their families and their communities. So you can imagine here that in order to stop the disease, you have to get people on the right combinations of medicines quickly, and then make sure that they take all of them so they get cured. So this is really a logistics issue. How do you do this? And so initially, people were treated in hospitals, but soon that became impractical because a lot of people had TB. So studies from the British Medical Research Council in India showed that community-based treatment could be, could be very safe, extremely safe and effective, and this became the norm for TB. So TB started being treated in communities. So in many places in the world, large hospitals gave way to community-based care delivery using nurses and health workers. So sick people were able to receive care for this disease in the communities where they lived. And in countries like Japan, this became fully integrated with their universal primary health care system. So the third thing that was done after finding people and getting them in treatment was making sure that people who were exposed to the disease didn't get sick with it. So it turns out that some people get infected with TB, but they actually, uh, for, for, for reasons we don't fully understand, they don't actually get full-blown disease right away. A lot of them, it'll stay in their body, and for a lot of them, they'll get disease within the next two years, and some people will get it even many, many years later when, when they're elderly. So these people need preventive treatment in order to prevent the onset of TB disease. 
So in the mid-1950s in Alaska, in the United States, the US Public Health Service started giving preventive therapy to people who were infected, contacts who were infected, but who didn't yet have the disease. So in combination with, this, with active case finding and the community-based treatment of disease, it resulted in a rapid drop in the prevalence of TB. So this is how the search, treat, prevent strategy became the holy grail for stopping TB. That was the secret sauce. And you can see on this graphic that the strategy was really effective. It caused a huge drop. It was so effective that it became US national policy in the early 1960s. And then soon thereafter, a number of rich countries followed suit and TB, dropped, TB rates dropped for them as well. Search, treat, and prevent. That was the secret sauce. But outside of rich countries, in the countries that contain most of the world's population, TB has continued at very high rates, causing a lot of preventable suffering and disease. Okay, so if we know what needs to be done, why have we failed to stop the TB epidemic globally? Like, what's the driver of this healthcare delivery gap? Well, it's a long story, but I'll give you the bullet. In the second half of the 20th century, as the colonial era came to an end, many of the newly independent states were forced to build health systems based on how much money existed in their national treasury. So one can see, of course, that this would be problematic given how extractive colonialism was and how it left so much poverty in its wake. So these countries were left with little money in their national treasuries. So this, result, this resulted in the perpetuation of weak and underfunded health systems in these countries. And then these health systems were further weakened in the 1970s and the 1980s when a lot of poor countries became indebted to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and were forced to cut back on health sector spending. So it was these weak and underfunded health systems that became an excuse for the provision of substandard care. So for example, in the early 1950s, when it was known that you had to give multiple drugs for TB in order to, to cure people, the World Health Organization advocated giving single drug therapy in poor countries, mostly because they said it was cheaper and it was easy for these countries to do. It was all they could afford. When the United States Public Health Service showed that preventive therapy was necessary to stop the spread of TB, it was deemed too complicated or impractical for poor countries, mostly because they didn't have the health system to deliver the care required. Even in 1993, when the World Health Organization declared TB a global emergency, they rolled out a strategy to combat TB that did not include any of the key ingredients that stopped TB in rich countries. So their strategy did not include active case finding, it did not include the correct treatment for all forms of the disease, and it did not include preventive treatment. So how do we fix this? How do we build a system that can eradicate TB as was done in rich countries in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. So, you know, how do you create a moral orientation and a movement uh, that, that can really build search and treat, search, treat and prevent and make it available for everybody? So with this in mind, a group of partners whose logos you see on the screen worked with people from high burden settings to create something called, it's an alliance called the Zero TB Initiative. And the goal of the initiative is to support communities to build the infrastructure for search, treat, and prevent so that they can eliminate TB. And the idea is that they'll create islands of elim elimination, and these islands of elimination, these islands of good care and good practice, will act as beacons and encourage others to do the same thing. Now, I'm happy to report to you that the movement has now grown and includes coalitions from about 15 countries including countries like China and India and Russia and South Africa and Pakistan and Mexico and Peru and even, and even the United States and Germany. So a number of funding agencies have now started looking at this and funding zero TB initiatives and a number of industry partners have even gotten involved. So one of the first places to actually implement the zero TB initiative was Karachi, Pakistan. And what they did is they looked at the experience from the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and they rolled out a, uh, a search, prevent, 
the search, treat, and prevent strategy that included a fleet of, of, of vans that you see here, of x-ray vans. The x-ray vans are linked to a uh, uh, artificial intelligence that tells you whether a person actually has some abnormality in their lungs, and then if they have an abnormality, right there and then, a genetic test for, a, a DNA test for, for TB is done. And right there and then, a sick individual is diagnosed. And right after that, their families are screened and given care if they need. So it's pretty incredible. After doing this intensely for more than three years, the rates of TB in the intervention area in Karachi have dropped by 20 to 30% in different intervention areas. So this is truly remarkable compared to the 1.5% drop that we're seeing globally. And so Karachi has demonstrated what can be achieved using this approach, even in a very complex setting. And so now, now other cities like Shenzhen and uh, Bangkok and Yogyakarta and uh, Lima have begun to follow suit. So anyway, my goal today is not to make you experts on TB elimination, although I hope you've learned something about it. You know, in the, in the short time that we've had together, I hope you're getting the sense that the infrastructure that we need for TB, the search, treat, and prevent, is essentially the same that we need for a bunch of other diseases that include diabetes, heart disease, disorders of mental health, even certain types of cancers like, like breast cancer. So let's think a little bit about diabetes. Diabetes, by 2050, 700 million people are going to have diabetes. So 10 million people have TB. I've told you how hard it is to treat. 700 million people are going to have diabetes. And probably an equivalent amount, if not more, are going to have prediabetes. And so those pre-diabetics, if they're, if they're found, their disease can actually be prevented. So without the search, treat, and prevent infrastructure, many people who are sick with diabetes won't even know they have the disease. So they won't, and they won't get diagnosed, and they won't even know that they need to seek care. And without care, people are going to have kidney failure, limb amputations, heart disease, all sorts of problems. And so when you think about it, with this volume of people, maybe 1.4 billion people who need to be accessed, the current system that we have, the hospital and clinic-based system, will become overwhelmed. So the platform needed for TB, it will not only help us deal better with outbreaks, like the ones we're reading about in the newspaper, like coronavirus, but it'll also help us fill the last mile of care delivery, the, the health delivery gap for this last mile, for so many other diseases. So, that's the strategy that I think can have an exponential impact in our lives and the lives of so many people. If we do it right, and if we do it soon. So let's make it happen. Thank you.